हरे कृष्णा गरुड़ प्रभु वेलकम बैक टू द मॉन्ग्स पॉडकास्ट इट इज सो वंडरफुल टू हैव यू वंस अगेन आवर लास्ट पॉडकास्ट ऑन राइटिंग वाज पर्सनली इंस्पायरिंग फॉर मी एज वेल एज फॉर मेनी डिवोटीज आर इंटरेस्टिंग राइटिंग एंड लेट्स होप टुडे वी कैन डिस्कस ऑन द टॉपिक व्हिच वी हैड ओरिजिनली प्लान टू डिस्कस थैंक यू फॉर कमिंग वंस अगेन थैंक यू प्रभु जी सो यू नो टुडे अ I was thinking we could discuss on do does does love really exist in the material world? So yes. broadly speaking, you know, for most people, if we consider from material perspective, they equate love with love in the material world itself. They don't have any idea of anything called spiritual love, and that's where we all were before before we were introduced to bhakti, and. Uh, personally i came from a if you are okay can i start with my some my experience or thoughts on this then yes, please. The context, you know i i grew up in a very good warm supportive family and uh, i i had polio when i was one and now when i look back i appreciate that actually taking care of any child is difficult but taking care of a child with a physical handicap it's mm. so much more challenging yes. so so actually i never ever felt uh, neglected or ne- my parents never made me feel that i was a burden so i felt very much loved and then later on when i was introduced to the philosophy and there are some speakers who some speakers who tend to say that that all love in the world is an illusion so i found that very difficult to digest i couldn't in any way deny the fact that my parents love for me was real now without love they couldn't have sacrificed now of yes. course they couldn't have, to the extent that they did now of course when we say that love is illusion or love is an illusion or when in our philosophy it is said often that is used in the romantic context between a man and a woman in the prabhupada also says that a pair mother's love for a child comes to the comes the nearest to selfless love in this world yes so now at that time that's how i reconciled it that maybe the male female attraction is illusory but not the parent child attraction hmm. now, but now i now as over the years have passed and say my cousins my brothers they have children and i think from their perspective actually to love a child the parents also need to love each other without that they can't really take care of a child well so we can't really say that if this love is re- this love is real and that love is illusory mm-hmm. right. so so i one of the scripture statement that help me make sense of it is that in the fourth canto when druva is very is devastated by the by being insulted by his fa- mother stepmother at that time suniti tells her tells him that whatever love i can offer you lord vishnu can offer you millions of times more love or lord vishnu can offer you more love than what millions of mothers like me can offer so then i thought at that time that if her love for her child is is illusion it's zero then millions of times of zero is also zero <laughs> <laughs> so it can't be zero in terms of quantity this might be small and that might be huge but now just because it is small in compared to comparison to krishna's love now that is not small in our present experience because we have no experience of krishna's love and if we experience love in this world for us that is real and if mm-hmm. such a such a small love appears so great for us then how great could be krishna's love so that way i feel that by appreciating love in this world we can appreciate krishna's love better we don't have to mm-hmm. reject reject love in this world to appreciate krishna's love mm-hmm. so these are this is my current understanding when somebody asks me this question but i would love to hear from you you must have thought much more on this 
um, your remarks are, I think, very insightful. Chaitanya Charanji, they're very insightful. Thank you. But the problem with your remarks is that most devotees, I don't think, understand what you understand. That would be my only criticism. <laughs> the problem is that it's not what you've just said is not well understood by most devotees. Let me try to characterize what most devotees think. Yes, please. If love, if if I love Krishna, that is true love. But if I love in this world, if I love my child, if I love my parents, if I love my husband or my wife, if I love my cat or I love my dog, this is simply lust. Unfortunately, that is the conception that I find quite prevalent. Here's the problem. We could say, well, how does that occur? Why is that the prevalent understanding? This goes back to um, uh, uh, defective, defective reading of Prabhupada's books. Wow. And a, not, not only a defective reading, but a, a misunderstanding of the nature of Prabhupada's discourse. Two things. I think this needs elaboration, both of these. Yes, yes. yes. indeed, indeed. It's fascinating, Chaitanya Charanji, because first of all, we have to understand, does Prabhupada come and when he speaks uh, in talks, uh, in lectures, morning walks, or when he writes, is he speaking in a completely systematic way? Is he speaking to, uh, in, in ways that are, um, uh, uh, you know, totally intellectually sound and logical and, and uh, airtight, um, cogent, and so on? No, he's teaching with a teaching voice. He will use at times exaggeration. He will use at times hyperbole. He will use absolutisms. He'll state something in absolute language when in reality it is relative. Mm. He's very dramatic. Prabhupada is very dramatic. Yes. If I were to speak the way Prabhupada speaks in the academics, no one would publish my work. Really? Can you give some examples of... Well, okay. Well, the example is exactly what we're talking about. So Prabhupada will say in places, there is no love in this world. Hmm. And in another place... He will state, love is ubiquitous. Love is everywhere. Look, even, even the cats playing, little kittens playing together. There is love. Mm. So first he is saying, there is no love in this world. It's a very absolute statement. Then he says, but love is everywhere. Both appear to be a contradiction. Mm. To remain the same, to take those two statements together, they are contradictory. But what Prabhupada, what we, what we need to understand is how to properly interpret Prabhupada's statements, to absorb Prabhupada's statements. Now, um, I'm going to be, I'm writing about this in, 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 for a publication, but I'll briefly tell you that the Tamasa, understanding of the statement, there is no love in this world. Tamasaguna uh, influenced uh, interpretation would have us believe that that is the be all and end all. Hmm. As it's stated in the 18th chapter of the Gita, to yeah. take that 
one statement as the whole of our philosophy is Thomas and Guna. Yes, you know that somehow I feel that is one of the one of the very underused verses in the Gita at 1822. Yes. It's such a yes. profound verse. Yes, I am referring exactly to that verse, Chaitanya Charanji. See, this is why I like talking with you. You know exactly what I'm speaking about. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes. And then, of course, if you take the, that statement, and by the way, this is typical of Kanishta, understand, Kanishta devotees, okay? Narrow minded, okay? Then, if a Madhyama comes along and understands that statement, but in light of other statements that Prabhupada makes, ah, then that's open-minded. And now we have a better, fuller perspective of what Prabhupada is intending to say. Hmm. So, but then if we come along with uh, an Uttama understanding, then we understand that one statement of Prabhupada's in light of the total philosophy. And that is when we can come to a really true and complete understanding. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to wait until we're Uttama Bhaktas mm. to understand what Prabhupada is saying. But we can achieve Uttama understanding by speaking to other devotees and coming together on the issue. This is a way to achieve Uttama understanding. To bring other devotees' broad-minded understandings together and to achieve a kind of total sense of what Prabhupada is saying. Okay. So, Just to, to what we want to do here, Chaitanya Charanji, yeah. is we want to, I want to try to present to you as much as possible, with your help, an Uttama understanding. Of what Prabhupada is saying. Yes, bro, that will be wonderful. Just to clarify the difference between yeah. Madhyama and Uttama, you are saying is Madhyama, we basically try to reconcile the two statements. But in Uttama, we try to understand the statement in the light of, say, the overall purpose of Prabhupada's presentation. That's right. Okay. In a way, the Madhyama understanding, Chaitanya Charanji, is discursive. It's inductive, step by step, upward and outward. But in Uttama understanding is going from the totality inward. It's intuition of the highest order. Uh, totality inward means that we, we, always have the overall of purpose of Prabhupada's uh, uh, discourse in mind. And from yes. there, we see uh, the particular statement. That's right. Oh, okay. It's more of a deductive process. Beautiful. Whereas the Madhyama understanding is more of an inductive process. Prabhupada, this is uh, such a, you could say, I always talk about contextualizing Prabhupada's statements. But yes. this is placing the same, a similar uh, frame of understanding within a very traditional hermeneutic. Like if yes. you look at Kanishta, Madhyama, Uttama, and then you look at inductive and deductive. Yes. These are terms which already devotees are familiar with. And yes. then, then it becomes more comfortable. Otherwise, devotees feel yes. that you, know, you are importing some... Like even if you use the word, we should study hermeneutics. Now, Prabhupada never yes. used the word hermeneutics. So immediately, some devotees start feeling suspicious. Are you bringing in some, some mundane scholarship into Prabhupada's works? That's so right. It's important that we use terminology. So yeah. this like, now I know these words are common. Rupa Goswami uses them. Bhaktivinoda Thakur also uses them in a slightly different sense in, Chet, in Krishna Samhita. But this using Kanishta Madhyam and Uttama for understanding Prabhupada's uh, message is this, is this your, uh, your thought of applying the words like that? This is yes. Cool. Yes. And tying it to those three verses to which you referred, Chaitanya Charanji, in the, in the Gita, 20 to 22 through 22. It's exactly the Gita's 
hermeneutic, if you will. Um, uh, by the way, I was the first devotee in the movement in the 1980s, actually 70s, to use the word hermeneutics because my, one of my fields of specialty is philosophical hermeneutics. In oh. fact, I was um, uh, privileged to take from uh, a couple of the world's most famous thinkers in modern 20th century hermeneutics. Now, I, I, don't, I won't go into all of that and what that means exactly, but, but here's the point. I wrote a paper for the most famous scholar in, um, in philosophical hermeneutics at the University of Chicago. I had not yet gone to Harvard. This was before I went to Harvard, but University of Chicago. And he hermeneutics. He thought the only issue, the only way that hermeneutics ever developed in the world was through biblical hermeneutics, which is the way it originally did in the West. Hmm. I wrote a paper showing Paul Ricoeur that in fact, in Mimungsa, hermeneutics is anticipated thousands of years earlier. He was blown away by the paper. And he gave me an A. Amazing. Is that paper there on your website or anywhere online? The paper is not available. Of course, you know, throughout my graduate study, the question, I have a stack of papers that I've written that go larger than the screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you don't want to read all my graduate papers. However, all of all my graduate papers, however, all of this be brought to bring a greater and deeper appreciation of Prabhupada's discourse, form of discourse. Hmm. This is the important thing. So when we try to understand something that Prabhupada says, we can either be narrow-minded, open-minded, or broad-minded. Kanishta, Madhyama, Uttama. And in fact, when we talk to people on the outside of the movement, we also find whether they are different levels of receptivity, very narrow level of receptivity, open levels of receptivity, and broad levels of receptivity. Okay, now so interestingly... Yeah, so you're differentiating between open-minded and broad-minded. I often use those words synonymously, but you are talking about open as madhyama and broad as uttama? Yes. Yes, because Prabhupada uses the word broad-minded for mahatma. And he's referring to uttama. Okay. Whereas open-minded is more of the spirit of a madhyama um, mind and heart. Okay. Whereas Kanishta is very insecure. Kanishta is like a little child. Yeah. I have to hold on to daddy's shirt, you know? That's and as a child, and a child, that's fine. But if you're an adult and you're still acting like a child, this is not good. That's so we need to help raise our abilities in appreciating Prabhupada's discourse to Madhyama and Uttama levels. That's amazing. So Prabhu, now again, we have two options because this is also yes. a fascinating topic and we could go deeper into Prabhupada's hermeneutics I think one of the topics which we, you had also suggested was understanding Prabhupada's difficult statements. So we could go deeper into that topic and that could be our discussion or we could fo focus on the example of Lao and have that and discuss about uh, hermeneutics in a separate discussion. I'm okay whichever way you want to take this. Of course, we'll have to, dis we'll have to discuss some amount of hermeneutics naturally, but, uh, uh, but I thought I just Clarify. However you want to go, I'm fine with it. Yes. yes. Let's do the last. Yes. 
let's do the latter because, and, and that is exactly why I began with the problem of interpretation, the problem of understanding Prabhupada's discourse, because he appears to be stating contradictory things. Mm. But this is Prabhupada's style. It's his form of discourse. Actually, it's what made Prabhupada so endearing to all of us in the early days. Prabhupada would be very dramatic. Sometimes he would make very extreme statements. Prabhupada, you know, said, we never went to the moon. And then other times Prabhupada said, well, you may have physically gone to the moon, but you couldn't see what was on the moon because you are limited with your sense. So he, he may adjust statements, he may contradict statements. So it forces us, if we are mature teachers of Krishna Bhakti, it forces us, these so-called contradictions and apparent paradoxes, these force us to come to an uttama vision of the philosophy. Otherwise, we are teaching things incorrectly. One of those things is there is no love in this world. Now, I can tell you, I, I once was speaking with a leading devotee in the movement. One minute, sorry. Before very you... leading, very. Sorry, Prabhu, if I'm okay. You mentioned that yes. this is what makes Prabhupada more endearing. Now, I would say that maybe it makes it more problematic to understand Prabhupada. How does it become more yes. endearing? So, can you explain that? Uh, yes. It, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Good. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you stopped me there. It, when, when, when we were with Prabhupada, he was his energy was intense and he came we we knew we were in the presence of the ambassador from the chaitanya parivar you know from the the chaitanya lineage the guru parampara he was this ambassador for the world to present Chaitanya Krishna Bhakti. I mean, the presence of such a person overshadowed his extreme dramatic statements that could appear contradictory. If someone else had said his statements, again, they would not have been accepted. Why were they accepted from Prabhupada? They were accepted from Prabhupada because, precisely because, we all felt and experienced Prabhupada as an ambassador, effectively, from the spiritual world. That is how he could get away with making seemingly uh, counterintuitive statements, like, there's no love in this world. And, you know, if I keep pressing that with you, Chaitan and Charanji, you're going to say, no, well, Garuda, the, I mean, I felt love for my parents. They loved me so much. They, they took care of me, even with my disability. And I said, no, no, Chaitan and Charanji. Prabhupada says, there's no love in this world. What you are experiencing was lust. <laughs> but that's, that's counterintuitive. That's true. You see? Oh, no. Right. So, so this is the issue. If we are narrow-minded Kanishta interpreters of what Prabhupada is saying, we will be ultimately misrepresenting Prabhupada because we have to put Prabhupada together. This is the challenge of every devotee. How to put together all of these diverse, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, widely um, uh, you know, sometimes contradicting statements. Um, uh, uh, how do we understand Prabhupada? This is not a task for everybody because this is very difficult. So leaders in the movement and leading devotees who are capable of writing bhashya, bhashya, we are a bhashya tradition. We, we must interpret 
what Prabhupada has been saying. In effect, we have to translate Prabhupada. I know that sounds awkward. Prabhupada was translating the sacred texts and bring them, bringing them here and commenting on them. But we, in effect, have to translate Prabhupada for the current public. So just one question about yes. that. So when you said that uh, all of you saw, because you were in Prabhupada's presence, so his, uh, some of the extreme statements, did you see them more like ornaments of his personality and not so much as to be always taken literally everything? Was that like an implicit understanding you had? I mean, something like that. Something like that. This was part of Prabhupada's dramatic presentation of the philosophy. He wanted to drive certain things home. Yes. But the fact of the matter, Chaitanya Charanji, the mm. fact of the matter is that there is love in this world. In fact, Prabhupada says love can start at a dormant stage. He talks about the dormant love in everyone's heart. And he talks about how there is love among um, uh, all living beings. He talks about, um, uh, he, he says in the Nectar of Devotion, the preface, he says, the basic principle of the living condition is that we have a general propensity to love someone. Yes. He says I'm that. No one can live without no one can live without loving someone. Right here, Prabhupada is saying this. Yes. This propensity is present in every living being. Mm. Okay? And then talking about children and parents, the, the next paragraph he talks about in, in the primary stage of a child, uh, uh, in a primary stage, a child loves his parents, then his brothers and sisters. And as he daily grows up, he begins to love his family, society, community, country, nation, or even the whole human society. But the loving propensity is not satisfied even by loving all human society. That loving propensity remains imperfectly fulfilled until we know who is the Supreme Lord. Beautiful, beautifully put, right? And here's the idea that it's not that there's no love in this world. Love is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Is it perfected love? No. Okay. Is it the fullest love that we can have? No. So we learn to love Krishna so we can love better, so we can love more and more fully. You know what I tell my university students? I tell them that we come into this world as infants expecting mother's love. Without mother's love, without love, at that beginning stage of life, human beings die. They literally die, not of lack of nutrition. They can be perfectly nourished food-wise. But if they don't feel loved, they will die. This has been proven. And at the end of life, we also review whether to, we, we ask ourselves two things. But before I get to that, throughout life, we have either felt loved or we didn't. We were either lacking love or we were finding greater love. The human beings die slowly if they are not loved, if they do not, if they are not nourished with love. We live on love. Love comes originally from Krishna, as we know. The Thladdini Shakti. The Thladdini Shakti. The Thladdini Shakti. Coming from the attribute of Krishna as Ananda. So, as you, as you well know. Now, so all love comes from Krishna. But love can be mixed. It can be mixed with our conditioning. It can be mixed with our you know, cultural milieus it, 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 and, and, and all kinds of influences. Love can be mixed. And the idea is to develop pure love. But what I ask my students 
or what I tell my students is that at the end of life, when one is on one's deathbed, there are two questions that you're going to ask yourselves. I warn my students, my 20 year old, you know, university students, you're going to ask yourself, have I loved much and have I loved well? Quantity and quality. Beautiful. See, Chaitanya Charan, I can make billions of dollars on one's deathbed. It doesn't make a bit of difference. In life, if those billions of dollars have distracted us from loving connections with others, it is a useless achievement. Mm. So, have I loved much and have I loved well? You know, well, of course, refers to purely, purely, yeah. Sorry. So, you know, this is, is bringing up two distinct responses within me. And at one level, yeah. it is so touching and so authentically true. But uh, maybe there is a part of me which is saying, you know, this is completely mundane. At the end of our life, we should be thinking, how much am I remembering Krishna? Not yes. uh, how much I have loved people. In fact, uh, uh, okay, I'll give one experience and now I'll try to con contextualize it. There was uh, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, one of our brahmachari, his uh, mother, she got cancer and she came and stayed in the temple. And uh, the, her son, Brahmachari's son, served her very well during the last days. And she was very grateful for her helping her in the end of the journey. But then, at the, when she was about to depart, at that time, now no offense to anyone, her whole family had become initiated. She had become, her husband also been initiated. So her husband told her that, I will not be there with you at the last moment. Because if I am here, you will think of me instead of thinking of Krishna. And then he walked away from her. And at that time, I had thought that, oh, this is so much uh, realization and detachment. But recently I reread it and I thought, you know, was that the best thing to do? <laughs> yeah. So now I don't want to criticize anyone, but it's just that I can maybe say that I, Either I have changed a little bit in my understandings and I'm realizing that I have changed. But what you said earlier about devotees thinking that love in the world is false. So I can see that that conception is still there within me. And a part of it is popping up. So yes, could you, you want to comment anything on how to reconcile or something? Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Once we have found Krishna, once we have known Krishna, once we have started loving Krishna, there, it is impossible, utterly impossible, to separate any love anywhere from anyone, in anyone, from anyone, from Krishna's love. It is utterly impossible. Well, all love comes from Vladini Shakti. All love is a manifestation of Krishna. It's the only thing that transcends, it's the only thing that transcends considerations of the material world and the spiritual world. Okay. But then suppose say a devotee uh, who is practicing bhakti seriously and to some extent knows Krishna, but then the devotee, a boy or a girl falls in love with a non-devotee. And because of that influence, they give up the practice of bhakti. So now, do we call that as, uh, that is not really love? Or that devotee was not able to understand that love? Now the dismissive understanding of it is just lust taking you away from Krishna. 
but you know for that devotee may feel more loud in that person's presence than in the devotee community and a physical attraction might be a part of it but not all of it so when you say that all love no love can be separated from krishna but some love can actually separate us from krishna isn't it well as a devotional community if we don't provide extraordinarily loving connections with one another then why shouldn't that brahmachari go and marry a non devotee in other words we thrive on love and if we can't exhibit that loving connection and that love from krishna with each other then what is the point of anyone coming to the iskon movement and living life within it that brahmachari who went off with that woman there was love there but there could also be conditioning and needs and this is where lust comes in okay do i love you chaitanya charan uh, because I need you. That's lust. But do I need you because I love you? That's love. Wow. So if so, then you see, okay. L- lust, is, lust is egocentric. Lust is the inability to be sensitive to the thoughts and feelings of others to serve another person in their truest heart if i love someone but i'm only thinking about my own needs and how the other person can fulfill my needs then it, it is lust but if love is pure then it is in itself its own reward this is exactly what krishna says to the vrja gopikas in the fourth chapter of the rasa panchadyayi he you remember he says yeah. i don't know that i could even reciprocate your love for me may your love be may the purity of your love be its own reward love is its own reward not whether someone returns or reciprocates the love or not the love itself is the reward the purity of love you know this is a, such a inclusive understanding so you said that if my need comes before the care for the other person then that is lust but if Correct. My, if my i care for the other person or other i care for the other person and in order to care for that person i need them so that's right then it's it's love so that's this, right so you could say this is a more expansive understanding of that chaitanya charitamrita verse which yes. talks about the difference between kama and krodha that is specifically <laughs> referring to krishna yeah but Kama, Kama, and Prema. Yeah, Atmendri, Atmendri, Priti, Icha, At Krishnendri, Krishnendri, Priti, Icha, Dhare Prema, Nam, Atmendri, Priti, Vancha, Bole, uh, something like Bole Kama. That it is one right. to satisfy one senses versus one to satisfy Krishna senses. That's right. So you are generalizing it from Krishna to everyone else, and whatever relationship we have. if we want to care for that person or we want that person to gratify us that's the difference yes and and again we've got to go back to the narrow minded open minded and broad minded of understanding krishna's presence mm-hmm. narrow minded means krishna's in a spiritual world he's too busy for everyone we're just supposed to surrender purify and go back to the spiritual world and hopefully krishna will accept us that's kanishta 
Majima is. Can you repeat? Sorry. Wow. Yeah. So, can so Kanishta is. Yeah. Kanishta is only seeing Krishna to world, barely even recognizing Radha. But <laughs> you know, only, only Krishna, you know, I'm only going to love Krishna. It's the only true love. love. Okay. Madhima, Madhima understands, my gosh, look at that. There is so much love between Radha and Krishna. Every temple I walk into, I see Radha and Krishna standing next to each other. There is love there. And look, they're inviting us to their love. They're gazing outwardly at us. They're inviting us to their love. That's a more Madhyama position. An Uttama position is, I see Radha and Krishna calling me through the hearts of everyone, everywhere. That's how an Uttama Bhakta can see everyone else as a Bhakta. It's not, uh, see normally when talk about Uttama, it is we see that they are all parts of Krishna, but you are taking it deeper yes. that Radha and Krishna are calling us through everyone. That's amazing. Yes. So, yes. I think this is, this Kanishta Vadyava Uttama, it opens up so many avenues for deeper discourse. This yes. should be the foundation of a theology of love for our movement. We really don't have yes. a, could say a theology for love as of now. That's right. True. There are layers, layers of understanding what Srila Prabhupada has given us. So we as teachers, Chaitanya Charanji, we have to elevate the understanding. And you and I, together, as well as other teachers, we have to come together and elevate our understanding to the Uttama vision. Beautiful. So Prabhu, just going back to the earlier point, let's say, say that that devotee gets attracted to a non-devotee and stops practicing yes. bhakti. So now it's at one level, rather than calling that devotee as uh, lusty, it is rather we as a community need to take responsibility that maybe we didn't offer sufficient love and support and that's why that person went away, went elsewhere. Yes. In, fact, in fact, I knew such a devotee that left the movement and um, got involved in trying to get a wife. And, um, and I said, uh, I will never reject him. If I have love for him, why would I reject him? Here's the problem. Too often, Chaitanya Charanji, we love devotees only in so far as they are obsequiously obedient and submissive to the movement. Chaitanya Charanji, you, your only value to me is how much you are submissive to the GBC. And until, and when at that moment, that day, when you say I'm no longer submissive to the GBC and I leave the movement, then I reject you. Your only value to me is the way you are an instrument of institutional doctrine and authority. I don't love you for who you are. That's, in a way, that's a very finely disguised form of lust. My God, you're inverting the whole hierarchy now. <laughs> exactly. Our, wow. our Krishna Bhakti is only based on pure love. And that doesn't mean that the institution becomes the ultimate object of that love. Rather, the institution is supposed to be facilitating the love between you and me. Beautiful. So, Not that I judge you, that you are only valued by me. You're only loved by me, so-called loved by me, insofar as you are a, a kind of um, representative, maybe even an automaton, a robot of ISKCON doctrine 
and dogma. That's no, true. no. Not I love you for who you are. And whether you're in the movement, out of the movement, whatever, just with that devotee I was speaking about, I stuck with him. I stayed in touch with him for 30 years. And then he returned to bhakti practice. I never stopped connecting with him. Okay, this is amazing. But I just had a similar experience recently. And I'll raise one philosophical point after that. There's one devotee with whom I was doing quite a good amount of preaching. And then they got involved in a relationship with a non-devotee. And then the devotee was quite a prominent and active devotee. And he was reproached so heavily. You're a lusty, you're lusty and this and that. So that devotee made a very telling comment. He says, that, that, no. he says, ISKCON is only a movement for devotees. It is not a movement for human beings. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that means if I don't conform to what a devotee is meant to be in some way, now, okay, they felt some human need, which was because of which they went somewhere. But it's, it was very telling and very sad, actually. Yeah, it so, is sad. Yeah. It is sad. The movement unwittingly has cultivated, has created a culture of depersonalization. Um, and I dare say that if Arjuna himself were a member of ISKCON and went through all the problems he went through, he might have been kicked out. Oh, God. <laughs> what do you mean by problems? Well, look at the problems uh, Arjuna had in the first chapter. He was, he went into a, a, a place of deep uh, a calamity, the, the deep depression, personal calamity. He was deeply depressed. He collapsed in a chariot. And you know, Krishna, if Krishna were Iskhan, he might have said, well, look, Arjuna, you got a lot of problems. Good luck and walk away. We should never walk away from devotees who have problems. In fact, it's the problems that allow us to get closer to Krishna through that devotee and in that devotee. It's a lot to process here. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now. Hey, hey, look, hey, you, you called me, Chaitanya Sharanji. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, this is your fault if it's too much to process. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just playing with you right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I understand. So, yeah. you know, it's like, uh, before I answer, what, before I can bring up a question, another question comes in. Because, yeah. okay, two, three things now. First is, yeah. that, uh, Within a community, isn't there some value for social pressure bringing about conformity? That say, if, if I'm too lazy to wake up in the morning and I'm living in an ashram where everybody else wakes up, that makes me wake up. If I'm, if I'm too lazy to go to a temple for a program, but then my friends go there and they expect me to be there. So now, if that is the only thing that makes me do that, that is unhealthy. But doesn't social pressure also play a positive role? That means uh, if a devotee is not able to meet a particular, some standards and the social pressure pushes them to come to those standards, isn't that a healthy thing? But then that same social pressure can make that devotee alienated when they're not able to meet the standards and then they feel I won't be accepted in this community. So, so how should the social pressure um, work? Any thoughts on this? Yes. Chaitanya Charanji, you should know me by now. I have thoughts on everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so 
but uh, instead of let me reword, let me suggest a reword. Instead of let me rewording of, of what you said, rather than social pressure, why don't we talk about a social structure and social support? Now, when social structure and social support become artificially pressuring someone, when someone finds it unnatural to be in that kind of social structure, well, then some adjustment should be made. And in bhakti, again, guidance from uh, the spiritual teachers is important here mm. to possibly make some adjustment. We saw Prabhupada making that adjustment all the time with devotees, personally. He gave us the standard, okay? He gave us the formula. But do you think that that formula is so rigid that it can't be customized? Of course it can be customized through the compassionate guru, guide. Of course it should. Whatever it takes to perform Krishna Bhakti, whatever it takes to evolve the heart of a devotee, to love more and to love more purely. This is our process. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. This, this is our process. Now, it's good to have the structure, but we have the structure to break the structure. And then we have the structure, and then we have the, the breaking of the structure to, to revitalize the structure. Structure, okay. breaking the structure, and reformulating the structure, and breaking the structure. There's a kind of dialectical movement that must be there to ensure that we do not get stuck in the lust of rigidity. Lust of rigidity. You know, I'll have to come back to this. This is such a <laughs> radical point. <laughs> but just before I come to that. I recently read something about uh, love in the context of parenting that parents need to offer both conditional and unconditional love. Unconditional love means I accept you as you are, but conditional love is you have so much potential, you can grow. And that is where sometimes uh, if there is, it's only a single parent family, then it becomes a big challenge for the same parent to play both roles. So if one parent can play the role of, say, uh, unconditional love, you know, I always accept you, I care for you. And another parent maybe de demand something, you know, you put, put your, get your act together. You are so much more than what you are, right? You can be so much more than what you are right now. Then the children grow up well. So, and I was also thinking of, say, the Chota Haridas pastime, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was like offering very strict standards. But all his associates were supporting him, yeah. all his associates encouraging him, trying to make, make some arrangement for him. So then we could say that even in the devotee community, there have to be both somebody who say maintains the existing structure yes. and somebody who, as you said, breaks the structure so that the person can still get unconditional love also. You put it that way? Okay, um, we have to be careful of the phrase unconditional love um, as long as we define it. Now, we are conditioned beings. Okay. The only unconditioned okay. yeah. being is Krishna. Now, when, we, as con when a conditioned being loves an unconditioned being, one can then develop something of unconditional love. Okay. Then one can bring that love back into all other loves. And this is why devoting oneself to Krishna and Radha and Krishna's love, devoting ourselves to their love, can actually make our loves here more complete, more selfless, more ahaitiki apatiyata. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So when I use the okay, word. Now, getting back to. 
What were you saying? Yeah, when I use the word conditional and unconditional love, I basically meant that. Now, do you have to fulfill some conditions to get my love? Like a uh, parent, you know, you get a A grade in your class, then I will praise you. If you don't get that, I will not even look at you. I won't talk with you. Also, that's extreme. But I was using conditional and unconditional in that sense. That does the other person have to fulfill some conditions okay. to get one's love? Okay. 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 Good. So let's let's apply it here in the devotional realm, or in the institution of ISKCON realm. Yes. So Chaitanya Charanji, you're a brahmachari, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I I love you, all right, as a brahmachari, but I love you as a brahmachari, but I will love you so much more if you become a sannyasin. Now, why would why why should I? You are Chaitanya. I love you more because of a social status. That is a finely veiled form of lust. So, if you this brings you back to the earlier point. Of, if I truly, yeah, yeah please, if please, I. Please. If you if you end up being a sannyasin, and I love you more for that, that is not really loving you. That is a finely veiled form of lust, because you have fulfilled my need to see you more a part of the institution. Amazing. So then, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh God. So it's something like, you know, if I am connected with a say, it's somebody who is a very highly placed person in the institution, that gives me a sense of specialness. That gives me the pride of proximity, uh, the pr and that is you are calling a subtle form of lust. Yes. yes. It's a finely veiled form of lust. I should love you for what you teach and who you are as a person, not because of the outward ashram you take up. I should love you for your ashram you're in. I should love you for the way you teach not because you represent the ISKCON institution. That's love. My God. So then will we need to... <laughs> <laughs> okay, now bring it the other way. <laughs> I love chat. <laughs> you know, you bring out um, so many, so many, you show how so many please. unquestioned biases are actually deserving to be questioned. Is it? We have said not in biases, preconceptions. Yes. So going the other way, I remember there was one brahmachari, and he, he was belonging to a particular temple, and he became a he, he became a grahastha, and he said that when he changed from saffron to white, he said I felt as if I was being treated like untouchable in the community. And he just left that community. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, so then, do we need to somewhat differentiate here between love and respect? Say, so based like the renounced order is given a res some amount of respect because of the order itself. So, say if some brahmachari becomes a sannyasi, maybe the respect. We give will be depend on the ashram, or if a brahmachari becomes a grahastha, maybe they may not get the same respect as brahmachari. Can we differentiate love and respect like that, or that would also be inappropriate according to you? Of course, there there is a kind of outward etiquette, but when you get right down to it, love supersedes any kind of formal protocols. 
Okay. Like for example, when, for example, when I see, you know, uh, Radhanath Swami, my old friend, I mean, you know, I'm supposed to, you know, bow down, offer my respects to Grahasta, to a sanya. But we just end up, like, squeezing the hell out of each other. <laughs> squeezing. <laughs> we just give each other a, a bear hug. Okay. And then I might think to, you know, offer my respects. And, and you know, we both get down and offer respects. But the immediate, the immediate emotion. Amazing. Is to, 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 to love no, that's that's why we're here, Chaitanya Charanji. We're here as a culture of loving relations. This is what we're about. Now, if we fall short of that, well, then there are reasons for that. We need to examine those. And usually it has to do with lust. Even within, we think that the ISKCON just by doing everything according to formulaic Krishna Bhakti and ISKCON, we think that we are, we are immune from lust. That being an ISKCON member is a vaccine against the coronavirus of lust. Yeah. So, but it is not. It is not. It's a virus. Lust is a virus that can go anywhere and everywhere. So, so now, you know, I earlier said, I'll come to that point about lust, your very broad definition. Say, if this is a devotee, and the devotee gets into a relationship with a non-devotee. This, this is a devotee, and they get into a relationship with a non-devotee. And that compromises their bhakti practices. And yes. uh, this is their authority. And that authority comes down heavily on them for, uh, for their whatever their lust or whatever, then normally what we would think is that devotee getting attracted to the non-devotee is lust. But what you are saying is that this authority is coming down disproportionately on that person could also be lust. The lust for controlling yes. the other person and making sure that they conform. Yes. 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 In fact, exactly. You, you put it well, Chaitanya Charanji. If if I have such a need for them to conform, that's lust. Instead, if I can practice loving acceptance of where they are, which gets back to what you said earlier, if I can first exercise total acceptance, that's, that is the humility of my love for you, for me to accept you for who you are and with all your weaknesses and all your strengths. To the extent that I can accept you and appreciate you and understand you for who you are, it is to that extent commensurately that I will be able to contribute to your strengthening and elevation. But if I cannot accept you for who you are, look, let's just say you started um, uh, taking uh, cocaine. Okay. Okay? Mm. Krishna forbid. But let's, you know, that's, of course, a very severe addiction and illness. But let's just say that happened to you. Would I love you less? I will tell you right now, Chaitanya Charan, I would not. I would come to you and I would say, Chaitanya Charanji, what happened? Help me understand why you are where you are. Let me understand. Let me support you. Tell me why and how it was that you started taking cocaine. I don't come in there immediately trying to fix you, 
but rather I try to understand what happened. What happened to you, Chaitanya Charanji? Let me lovingly understand to the extent that I lovingly understand why you took cocaine, how it was that you took cocaine, what pressures you were under, why you're trying to numb yourself, it is to that extent that I will be able to help you. But if I come in there and say, Chaitanya Charanji, you're in a lot of maya, shame on you. You you have left the, the lotus feet of your spiritual master, you're a disgrace to ISKCON, shape up. That is finely veiled lust. Because I have not been, I have not been working from a place of love and understanding and the humility of understanding. If I don't, then that is lust. Oh, is it true? Is it ideal? Of course it's ideal that Chaitanya Charan should return to the lotus feet of his spiritual master and, and take up the practice. Of course that's true. But if I use that as, as a kind of lusty entrance into our relationship at a point where you are at a very low place, this is lust. I can just think of so many devotees whose spiritual lives would have been so much less troublesome or less painful if they had met someone with this kind of understanding. So Yes. Yes. So often, now the devotee, you know, somehow I'm still hesitant to call that as lust. Just as the word lust has got such a negative connotation that uh, that even when, say, uh, say a man gets attracted to a woman or a woman gets attracted to a man, you know, even then, I, I hate to, I hesitate to use the word lust. It may be a part of it, but it's a very reductionistic term for what is a, what is, could be much more than what we use that. So similarly, even for this also, I, I would say that, now I know devotees who have come down like that devotee leaders on some younger devotees and uh, at one level we could say that they might be well intentioned so there could be lust at a very subtle level but they could also be well intentioned but yes. their good intention sometimes good intentions are not necessarily good enough or as we say the road to hell is paved with yes. good intentions yes so so lust could be one component of it rather than all of it. Just as in yes. the male-female relationship, similarly in the authority-subordinate relationship. There could be one part of genuine concern. There could be another part of the, the desire to control. How can a devotee who I have trained behave like this? So I am concerned not just for that devotee, I am concerned for my image also. What will people yes. think of me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's true. I mean, as, as, a, as a teacher and as, um, uh, you know, having a handful of disciples, I am concerned about whether or not they represent me well or not so well. Hmm. Oh, look, I mean, I mean, part of this is, is healthy, but part of it can be unhealthy. I mean, even in the, in the, in the uh, phenomenal world out there, I mean, I spent all those years at Harvard, okay, two master's degrees and a doctorate from Harvard. Well, I had finished my dissertation, and my advisor, my doctoral mentor said, I think you need to stay here one more year. I thought I was finished. He said, I think you need to stay one more year. Harvard doesn't want to let anyone leave unless they feel they have completely, they're completely capable of representing Harvard level scholarship. Well, 
I mean, you know, okay. So in the same way, I, I will admit that there's a careful balance. On the one hand, I want my students to represent my teachings properly and not misrepresent me. But on the other hand, I also have to respect that they are at certain levels of immaturity and levels of growth that through which they must go. So I can't impose it so heavily because that would be lust. Mm. And then to not impose anything or not to expect anything would be not lust, but would be, you know, uh, 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 too lax, maybe too, too lazy. Be, yeah, maybe it could be a responsibility also. Yes. Yeah. See, you know, this so, Harvard example is very striking because at one level, after you, after somebody graduates, then they represent Harvard much more. If they, then if they are just students, even as students they represent. Right. But when they, if they are graduates, they represent much more. That's so right. Often within our movement, we don't have very clearly that kind of progression. So it's yes. almost like every devotee is expected to follow a particular standard and which is good at one level but uh, there, that there could be gradations and uh, different devotees at different levels can be expected to have different levels of standards. Yes, well, I mean, look, once a, a very distressed Buckton called me up and said she had just attended, this was years ago, just attended 26 Second Avenue, a lecture by a sannyasin hmm. coming through. And of the 45 minutes he was lecturing, he devoted 30 minutes, 30 minutes to condemning homosex. Is that what the seat of Vyasa is for? No. If I had been there, boy, is he lucky I was not there. If I had been there, I would have stopped him after two minutes and said, excuse me, Swamiji, what does your condemnation of homos, wait, you're imitating Prabhupada's word, which is not an English word, actually, homosex, and you're English, so you should say homosexuality. But, you know, you're up there condemning homosexuality for the last two minutes. Is this what we bhaktas are about? We are not here to condemn people. We are here to raise people. We're here to bring people into our loving circle. Now, if you don't have a loving circle, I can see why you're busy condemning homosex. Anyway, he's very fortunate. He's very fortunate, Chaitanya Charan, that I was not in the audience because I don't tolerate this kind of thing. My God. You know, this is a, I think homosexuality is itself a big subject, but since you brought it up, so again, we could say that uh, we all have, we may, our standard movement has certain standards and actually even how those standards are to be applied in this context, it's also not, is we are also not clear about it right now. There are different devotees are different, uh, different understandings, but more importantly, your point independent of specifically of homosexuality is that you know, if we start condemning then we are not representing Vyasa. Can you hear me? Exactly. Too? Exactly. Now, I had heard something opposite of this, that the very purpose of the Vyasa son is to condemn the current forms of illusion that take people away from Vyasa's teachings. 
Now, of course, you could say that we could say that whether homosexuality takes people away from Krishna, but okay. some people do have this idea that condemning the current brands of illusion is what we are meant to do. Condemning is Kanishta. Understanding how people get distracted by the worldly forces and are moving away from their own true hearts is Madhyama. And Uttama is how to see the big picture of how ultimately everyone is a loving servant of Krishna. Now, the question we must ask is, uh, as teachers, when we sit on the seat of Vyasa, do we want to be merely condemning people? Does that inspire people? Or do we show how we understand how people could be caught up in the phenomenal world, but how they could ultimately be brought back? Which is better? That's beautiful. It is a Kandishta Madhyama Uttama. So now, again, going back to our Prabhupada hermeneutics question, we could say that yes. there are times when Prabhupada is condemnatory, maybe, and that's what sometimes comes out quite strongly in his writings. But yes. Prabhupada, in his personal dealings, yes. was never condemnatory, practically never. He was very, very understanding. In fact, his personal servant, I believe his name was Nanda Kumar. I believe it's in the letters where Nanda Kumar said, Srila Prabhupada, I'm married. I, I'm not meant to be married to a woman. I'm just not. He then Prabhupada said, then, then you, find, you find a nice boy and uh, you continue your Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada said that? My heart yes. Mind. Yes. You see, it, we have our standards. Okay, the standards are there. I, no one will deny it. You won't deny it. I won't deny it. But what is the function of standards? How do we relate to standards? How do we help others relate to those standards? This is the key thing. We're not a bunch of mechanical automatons. Individuals need specific kinds of guidance in relation to those standards. Beautiful. Not mechanical automatons, but we need individualized guidance. Yeah. Now, yes. I remember I was thinking that now I, I was reading a little bit about how cults are formed. I was reading about how so some young educated people go into fanatical organizing like, IS, like the Islamic states and other things. So then I read one person, his narrative, and he said that, you know, I was so happy because now I don't have to think about anything. I just have to follow and I'll be delivered. <laughs> then I remembered one time one devotee also, he said, I asked him what attracted you Krishna consciousness? He said, it made my life so simple. I don't have to do anything except obey my authorities. Well, then I correlated, maybe in the first few years it is good, but if we have a very, yeah, right. if we have a oversimplified understanding of Krishna consciousness, then we may think of Krishna consciousness as simply like ticking a list of bullet points. And if anybody is not exactly. ticking those points, then they are wrong. Exactly. But there's so much more to Krishna consciousness than that. Yes, yes. Actually, Krishna consciousness is made for human beings, not merely devotees. Yeah, so true. Uh, you're taking it back to the earlier statement by the yes. devotee. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, so, right. that's true. 
So now just going back to this point of, you know, mechanical automatons versus, uh, versus uh, individualized guidance. So the moment we have an institution, and especially as that institution becomes bigger and bigger, then just because of the size of the institution, sometimes there is a greater likelihood of the mechanization rather than the individualized interactions. Yeah. So that's right. So that means even if we belong to a bigger movement, as in individually, we devotees need to cultivate our relationships rather than ex just belonging to a big community. We need to develop our deeper relationships. That is exactly right. Yeah. The institution, the purpose of the institution is to facilitate loving connections between devotees period part of that is also whatever relationship that happens to be whether it's a, a husband and wife whether it's been parents and children whether it's a community and community leaders devotional leaders whether it's a, a, a brahmachari a grahasta a vachari or, or or a sannyasin whatever it, it doesn't matter those designations are secondary totally only have something to do with krishna bhakti and so far as each of these ashrams and then the varnas also in terms of how they facilitate bhakti bhakti is always the primary focus and everything else is merely tethered to it beautiful Reinforcing that point which you said, the institution is meant to facilitate relationships. Prabhupada says in the Nectar of Instruction, in the Dadati Pratigranati verse, that the Krishna yes. consciousness movement is meant to facilitate these sixfold exchanges among devotees. That's right. No, no, That's what right. he says something deeper actually. He says the Krishna consciousness movement is nourished by these sixfold exchanges among devotees. So he's saying yes. not just that the movement is facilitating, but the movement's nourishment depends on these exchanges. Yes. Yes. It has it happens right here. For example, right here between you and me, Chaitanya Charanji. Mm -hmm. This this nourishment, going deeper with the philosophy, going deeper and appreciating one another for one for each other's understandings of the philosophy and, and practice. And this, it, it, the nucleus, the nucleus relationship within Krishna Bhakti is one devotee's heart in relation to another devotee's heart. Hearts don't take on ashrams. Hearts don't take on varnas. Hearts are just hearts. Beautiful. <laughs> You know, this is again such a universalist understanding of that the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's words, Naham Vipro. Mahaprabhu himself took up these designations only insofar as they facilitate Krishna Bhakti. Now, of course, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami said that Mahaprabhu Gauranga took up sannyas because he could better uh, uh, command the respect of the educated peoples. And so sannyas worked at that time in that place, but what works now is the PhD. The PhD I call the dunda of the age. And it's not a whole, whole lot better than a Harvard PhD. <laughs> PhD is the dunda of the that's age. Of the, that's quite provocative. That's right. <laughs> And what did you say? The heart. PhD demands the respect of the PhD. Is the, yeah. So so um, the the, um, uh, it, the the PhD commands the respect of of the intellectual class. And I said that a Harvard PhD it doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. So it's not just any PhD. Prabhupada wanted us to be the best. He wanted us to attain the highest, whatever it was. He said he wanted devotees, you know, as chairpersons of religion departments. Translation, he wanted us leaders in scholarship. 
That's the translation. So true. So just, uh, this is an important subject. Uh, I hope we can discuss this more about Prabhupada's vision for devotees. But just coming back to our topic of, your point was, I understand that Varana's ashrams uh, are meant to facilitate loving relationships. So, absolutely. Yeah, so now within our movement, say at one level, there has to be certain standards, as you rightly said earlier. So the key question comes up that rather if somebody deviates from the standards, rather than condemning it as lust, you know, we need to understand that person, what, what made yes. them do that. And then we try to try to help them the way we can. So yes. I had a framework for this. Maybe you, I would like your thoughts on this. They talk about okay. so there is detachment, which to some extent is in the mode of goodness. Yes. So normally we talk only of attachment and detachment. But yeah. I say that actually it's not just two things. There's attachment, detachment, and then there is commitment, which is something which is, which is not the same as attachment. And uh, yes. which is significantly different. And uh, if uh, much, of our, much of our tradition actually is talking about people, so the way I understand it is that uh, attach, attachment is in the mode of passion, detachment is in the mode of goodness, and much of our, sorry, attachment is in the mode of passion, then commitment is in the mode of goodness. And much, much of our tradition is actually meant to take people from goodness to transcendence. So Parikshit Maharaj is already following Dharma. So much of the tradition is meant to take us from goodness to pure goodness. And in that, there is, there is a condemnation of attachment, which is in the mode of passion. Mm -hmm. uh, so that one can rise to pure goodness. But unfortunately, most of society today is not at the level of goodness. And at the level of ignorance, you can say at the level of ignorance, there is neither attachment nor commitment, but it is actually simply, we could say aversion to responsibility. So it is, it is simply irresponsibility. And for a person who is not very evolved, that aversion to commitment can seem like detach, can seem like detachment. Mm -hmm. So detachment is, is, quite above goodness. So, you know, so people who are in the mode of ignorance and if they are talked prematurely about detachment, then they might just sink deeper into ignorance. So first mm -hmm. of all, we need to rise to the level of commitment and commitment requires, as you said, love in this world. Without that, there cannot be any commitment. So many times uh, that aversion to commitment when it is mistaken to be detachment then it can cause chaos because yes. no nothing can function in society unless there is commitment so i have your, your response on this about commitment attachment attachment yes um i like your i like your um uh, analysis in this um I have written um, about the two poles, um, humility and passion. Not mode of passion, but passion in the sense of commitment in the way you talk about it. Um, detachment in the sense of humility in the way you talk about it. Both humility and passion are epiphenomenal consequences of a full, loving heart. If I love you, if I love you, I will approach you with the humility of trying to understand you. 
and if I love you, I will exercise, once I've understood you, I will exercise a passion to see if I can help you. But they have to be both. Too often in the movement, we exalt humility as if it is a quality by itself. Humility is a natural consequence of love, of prema. Beautiful. Passion is a natural consequence of love. We need both. Once someone was telling me, Garuda Prabhu, I'm trying so hard to be humble. I said, humility is not something you try for. Humility comes naturally the more you love the bhakti process, the more you love the spiritual guides in your life, the more you love devotees, the more you love Radha and Krishna, then humility naturally comes. Humility cannot be forced. Humility cannot be practiced. Some people would disagree with me on that last one. But, but what I mean practiced, I mean artificially enacted. It's a natural consequence of love. That's so beautiful, you know. So we could say that if you say humility is epiphenomenal to love, that means I'm so concerned about you that I stop being self-centered. I stop being egocentric out of my outflow of my emotion and my energy toward you. But yes. if instead, if I have no outflow of my emotion and energy, and then I try to practice humility, that will simply end up my beating myself down. And that would be art, both artificial and unhealthy. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So I mentioned that, that when Radhanath Swami and I see each other, we immediately embrace. So that is the passion part. What is it? Yeah, well, it's, it's both. It's, it's, it's by an embrace, I am, I am telling Swamiji, I love you for who you are. You are so wonderful for who you are. Mm. And I'm also saying with my embrace, I, but I wish to know you more. I wish to serve you more. How can I be closer to you? In love, we cannot be close enough to the beloved. There, if love is true and love is pure, you can never be close enough to the beloved. Never be close enough. Amazing. That's right. Uh, yeah. So, so that is the passion part. You want to be more and more with that person, connect with them more and more. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, but you can't do that without the humility of total acceptance and appreciation and understanding. Just like when the Vrajagopikas, the Vrajagopikas, so, so when you, the, Krishna's lotus feet, all the sages wish to, you know, bow down to Krishna's lotus feet. But the Vrajagopikas uh, also want to embrace Krishna. Uh, intimately. And so, so why do the gopis want to take Krishna's lotus feet, which, which honors reverence, but they take Krishna's lotus feet and hold them to their chests. And that expresses their passion. So you see, there's both humility and passion in the ultimate example of bhakti. Beautiful. You know, sometimes we, we can discuss more about the gopis' love for Krishna from this perspective. Otherwise, sometimes we consider it to be so exalted as to be almost untouchable. Now, yes, untouchable it's in, both. A, in a divine sense. And That's then, right. And then we don't learn anything from it and we can't get the inspiration that we could otherwise get from it. 
That's right. It's both. It's untouchable, completely untouchable, and completely touchable. <laughs> Beautiful. Completely untouchable, completely touchable. Yeah. That's right. So, just, I, I think, I mean, I would love to go in the Gopi's direction, but let's focus right now on this humility and passion, your point. So, yes. So, say going back to the earlier example of this devotee, authority who came back on the devotee who, who got deviated from some standards. Yes. So, normally, we think of humility in terms of offering obeisances and stuff like that. But humility yes. also would mean that you should, we should be able to accept the other person for what they are. And, yes. and uh, so, there are two aspects in the relationship. There is accepting... And I, I like the way you are saying helping, but often there is also the accepting and the expecting, especially if somebody is in authority position, I expect right. you to do something. I expect you to grow in a particular way. So right. we, the humility is associated with accepting and maybe the passion could be associated with expecting. Yes. Yes. So yes. there are numerous ways to translate these two essential epiphenomenal consequences of love. Yeah. And if only, say if, only, if there is only expecting, then that will not feel like love. That's right. That's right. That becomes dangerously close to a finely veiled form of lust. By finely, you mean thinly or thickly? <laughs> thinly, fine, very subtle. Yeah, uh, sukshma. Okay. Yeah, but subtle in the sense that it's not very easy to perceive also, isn't it? Correct. So in that people, case, will, mis people will mistake it as devotion, but yeah. actually it's lust. Yeah, so, in, so I was saying thickly veiled in the sense of difficult to perceive. The veil is so big that you can't perceive it. Yeah, bhakti rasa bhasa. Oh, bhakti rasa bhasa. Yes. Mm -hmm. Appearance. Yeah. So is there something to say also about accepting without expecting how that could also be unhealthy in some way? Yes, that can be. If all you do is accept, accept. See, part of humility is also making yourself vulnerable and, 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 and presenting yourself as, um, let, let's say you say something to me and I accept it, but, but it troubles me. If I don't have the ability to um, expect you to help me understand it further, I'll simply accept it and just be troubled by it uh, and without any help from you. Um, that would be passivity, a passivity that is unhealthy. That would be a kind of obsequiousness that is uh, truly self-destructive. Whenever Mahaprabhu, it is stated, had any questions, he went to his spiritual master, Ishwara Puri. We should never simply accept something as if we are, again, automatons. We might have questions. We might have doubts. Bring those up. So important. It's part of love to have that trust. I know my spiritual guide loves me. And I know if I bring before him or her my doubts, he or she will receive them and respond to them also caringly and lovingly. Okay. So just to understand, this is an important point of vulnerability. Now, I talked about the yeah. authority and subordinate. So are you right now talking from the subordinate's perspective of the willingness to become vulnerable or the yes. authority's perspective? So subordinate's perspective. Okay. Yeah, so then that means... Uh, but an authority also, the authority should also be vulnerable and, and, and available for pariprashna. Pariprashna, as the verse says, pariprashnena, right? Pariprashna. Prashna means inquiry. Inquiry, but pari prashna means all kinds of inquiry, 
every kind of inquiry. If a guide cannot respond meaningfully, lovingly, and caringly to all inquiry, then he should not be a teacher. I never thought of the difference between Pariprashna and Prashna. So, yeah. So all oh, kinds the Upasarga. The Upasarga changes a word incredibly, right? The, yeah. I'm sorry, um, prefix, Upasarga, right? right, uh, right. Putty, putty means all around, as in parameter, right? Putty. So, all kinds, Prashna means inquiry. That's the simple verbal uh, stem, right? But yeah. Putty Prashna. All inquiry, every kind of inquiry. Hari Prashna. Yeah. This is deep, deep stuff, huh, Chaitanya Sharanji? Very deep, you know. So when you say all kinds, it is not just about, say, this is the standard and I have to follow it. But this doesn't make sense to me. I can't do this. So all the practicalities that might come up in trying to implement a spiritual standard in real life. So that is what a person should be able to answer. That's what you're that is correct. all kinds of queries. Okay. All kinds of queries. Yeah. There must be caring, loving, and understanding responsiveness. I did, notice I didn't say absolute answers. No. I said loving, caring, and understanding, sensitive responsiveness. Responsiveness, yeah. That, that is honest. We should never speak about something that we don't know. I always marvel, I always marvel at how sannyasis are advising grahastas on how to deal with their grahasta issues when they've never been married. How does that work? Now, maybe there can be some good, helpful advice in general, but again, do not speak about things about which you have no information or experience. I mean, how would you like it? Okay, I mean, when I was in uh, Chaupati, all the brahmacharis, they, after hearing my class, the Sunday feast lecture I gave and so on, in the Bhagavatam classes, they asked me to come to the brahmachari ashram to speak to all of them. Um, I have a picture of myself with 40 brahmacharis, okay? <laughs> so, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not there to help them become necessarily more brahmachari, but I am there to help them become more bhaktas. And I told them, I said, I don't care what ashram you're in, whether you're brahmachari, grahasta, vanad, uh, Vanachari, sannyasi, whatever. There must be companionship, loving, caring friendship in all ashrams. Mm. Otherwise, you will not be able to sustain your ashram in the movement or, frankly, outside the movement. Love is what keeps us all together. Yes. So that means, you know, we can talk about using universal principles of living and they apply to all ashrams, but specifics about particular things, if we don't have experience about that, it's best not to speak about those. That's right. Yes. That's right. I mean, what is it if sannyasins come to me and they start talking to me, you know, how can I be a, a better sannyasin? I said, well, if you need advice specifically in that way, a Swamiji, Better than you go to one of your sannyasi god brothers. But yeah. if you want to ground your ashram in Krishna Bhakti, that I can speak about. Part of good teaching is to be very, very honest about what it is that you realize and what it is that you do not realize, and to respond. There's nothing wrong with saying, I can't really speak to that because I'm not very knowledgeable 
in that area. No problem, that's not a problem. So part of being a good Brahmana is to be truthful. Truthful in one's teachings. Truthful about what one really, what one really does know. And of course, that's also a loving thing to do. If I really care about you, why would I want to misguide you with things that I don't know? Again, again it, it all comes from the heart. If I'm coming from the heart, I'm going to be totally upfront, honest, and vulnerable with you in my response. Yeah. So sometimes when there are standards, then along with standards, a particular image comes up. And then preserving one's image becomes more important than being real in the relationship. And then that's where ad admitting vulnerability can become a problem. Yes, that's another example of finely veiled form of lust, trying to become a sannyasin because he wants to be respected more. Oh. In the movement. Yes. He doesn't understand that it's not about ashram that will gain you respect. You know how many sannyasis we have now? Tons of them. That's not what gains someone respect. It's what one does. It's how one connects to others. For example, it's what you're doing, Chaitanya Charanji. What you're doing creating dialogues with people and with people even like me which can't be easy <laughs> it's wonderful not easy it's ecstatic <laughs> <laughs> we do we do need to wind up though um because i've got some things waiting but um was this all right was this uh this was profound and uh you know i felt uh there could be another session maybe i'll just make two three points and then you decide yes. how you want to take it forward how, how much time yes. do you have? five minutes ten minutes fifteen minutes i will tell you five minutes okay so okay. then then uh, so Prabhu, maybe i'll just summarize and you can put a concluding point and then we can go forward in future discussions surely so we discussed today if there's love in the material world and I shared about my experience of my parents' love. And you said that in one sense, it's obvious that there's love. But why is there the understanding there's no love? Because of the nature of Prabhupada's discourse and our understanding of Prabhupada. So Prabhupada had a dramatic way of presenting things where sometimes he made one statement, he was quite extreme, but then he would make another statement. Then I think this Kanishta Madhyama Uttama, this is the most distinctive thing which strikes, stands out in our conversation. So the Kanishta mode mm -hmm. is just taking one statement and absolutizing it. Madhyama is, deduct, is more inductive, trying to make sense of various statements one by one. But deductive is understanding the whole purpose. And then he said like a most natural form of intuition, where you see the part in the context of the whole. And that was profound. And then we discussed that in terms of why there is no, about no love in the world. Uh, so those kind of statements are primarily de delivered in a particular context. And uh, as devotees, Prabhupada also said like an actor of devotion that there is nobody can live without loving. So <clears throat> we discussed further also how Prabhupada's statements sometimes uh, you also talked about condemning is Kanishta, then trying to understand the various statements. Uh, no, condemning people is Kanishta, trying to understand people is Madhyama, and trying to see how these people are already connected with Krishna and connecting them further. That is Uttama. So yes. that was beautiful again. Then there is, we talked about that the, another striking point was that thin, like finely veiled form of lust. So yeah. in the name of love and conforming to standards, there if somebody might be exer exercising 
So somebody might say, I am protecting you from lust. Like authority might be saying a subordinate, I am protecting you from lust, but they might themselves be yes. in lust. So because That's right. so lust means basically wanting to control others or rather you put it that when our need for the other person is more than our caring for that person. So yes, I need you to maintain my image that I am such a great trainer of devotees. And then you are spoiling my image Then that will not work. So then we talked about also humility and passion. You mentioned that humility means to accept people where they are at and passion means that we want to help them. And one way we help them is also to help them grow, to elevate, to come to the standard. Then another striking point in that connection was that when we try to help when we, we think we are helping people, but we may end up hurting them because we may think that this is like a, you talk about narrow minded, open minded and broad minded. That is also beautiful. So many devotees yeah. may get hurt if the authorities are in a narrow minded frame, yes. in a narrow minded frame. And then uh, Toward, uh, then the, we discuss also how the movement is meant to nourish the nourish the devotees to sixfold exchanges. But sometimes the movement may mandate that who is a devotee, who is a non-devotee. And then if we are relating with people based on only the institutional norms, then actually that's not real love. We accept the person for who they are. And if somebody goes yes. off, we understand them and then see how we can help them. And yes. for the end about this spiritual guidance when you give Pariprashnena, it is not just about giving standards, but dealing with the nitty gritties of how those standards are to be implemented. And then having the vulnerability sometimes that we may not know how to implement certain standards. And then depending on the particular ashram. So we can focus more on universal principles than specific uh, uh, technicalities, specifics of the applying. So we could yes. say that love exists everywhere, but love in its fullness exists in Krishna. And our challenge yes. is not to reject all the other loves, but to help people grow from where their love is toward loving Krishna. Isn't it? Beautifully put. Yes. Any concluding words, Prabhu? This is amazing. I think you, if you were a university student of mine, I would have just given you an A. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe in a future lifetime, I'll have that fortune. <laughs> no, in the future lifetime, I will be your student. Um, but uh, no, you've, uh, I think you have summarized beautifully. Um, I appreciate so much how you are really tuning into these ideas. And that makes our conversation and dialogue very enjoyable for me. So I appreciate the opportunity, Chaitanya Charanji. That's all I have to say. See, I have two regrets after this discussion. First is that it's not long enough. And second <laughs> yeah. is, I wish I had this kind of discussion 10 or 15 years ago. I would have learned so much and I would have also caused less damage to others. But still. <laughs> I am afraid I can say the same for myself. Yeah, maybe we have to go through Kanishta to come to Madhyama. We cannot just jump to Madhyama. So maybe that's a part of our growth. A child, has to, a child has to be a child before he, he can be an adult. Yes. Yes. The problem comes when the he child imagines an their identity. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the problem will be when the yes. child imagines that's their identity. Yeah. That's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's so so look, thank you. Thank Chai. you, Prabhu. And I look forward to having you in future also for more such discussions. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Yeah. Yeah.